This is the year of foldable screens, and while this new tech definitely, definitely has some growing pains to overcome, we wanted to know how do you make a screen bendable? Welcome to Upscaled, our show where we explore the components that make tech better. In our last episode, we asked who wanted to know more about transistor design, and the response was frankly overwhelming. A ton of you said you wanted to know more about CPU manufacture and quantum effects in chips, so I've definitely got some reading to do. We'll be bringing you more episodes on that topic in the future, but today we are changing tracks to focus on OLED screens. Though, if you pay attention, you might notice some similarities between LEDs and transistors. Whether it's the Galaxy Fold, Huawei's Mate X, or LG's roll-up TVs, flexible OLED screens are popping up everywhere, though they're not exactly new. The first flexible OLED was actually developed at Santa Barbara's Uniax Corporation way back in 1992. Sure, it was dim and wildly inefficient, but this early flexible OLED led the path for today's bendy screens. So what's happened since then? Cue the new logo. We're legitimate now. Anyways, in devices, flexible screens have also been around longer than you might expect. First appearing on the Galaxy Round in 2013, a phone that never made it to the US. We first saw flexible screens on the Note Edge and the Galaxy S6 Edge. But wait, you're saying those phones weren't foldable. Well, no, they weren't. But to get those curved screens, Samsung built those OLEDs on a flexible base and then glued them to a curved glass layer. Let's talk for a sec about what OLED displays actually are. Until recently, most TVs, monitors, and iPhone screens were all LCD or liquid crystal displays. LCDs use particles that respond to electricity to block or let through light from a backlight. These were a huge step up from old cathode ray tube screens, but compared to OLEDs, they have a few disadvantages. Compared to OLEDs, LCDs generally have worse contrast and color range, slower response times, which can lead to a smeary image, and they require a backlight, which makes them thicker. In OLEDs, each pixel generates light individually, eliminating the need for a backlight and making them potentially super thin, which is a huge plus if you are trying to make a bendable screen. But let's take one more step back here and talk about what exactly an LED is. You probably know that LED stands for light emitting diode, and a diode is just a type of electrical connection where electricity can only flow in one direction. Typically, this pairs a semiconductor with extra electrons, which is called an n-type, with a semiconductor with space for more electrons, called a p-type. And as you run electricity through the diode, electrons get excited enough they will jump from the n-side to the p-side. As they do, they fall back down into a lower energy state and release some energy in the process. In a silicon diode, that energy gets released as heat. But if you make the diode from certain gallium compounds, some of the excess energy gets emitted as a little flash of light. This is how a typical LED works, with different metal compounds giving you the different colors of LED. In an OLED, the semiconductor material, like silicon or germanium or gallium, gets replaced with special conductive organic molecules. And we don't mean fertilizer, pesticide-free molecules here, but compounds with a carbon backbone, just like alcohol or glucose. The chemicals used in OLEDs are a little more complicated, though, and include compounds like bis-2-diphenylphosphenylphenyl-ether oxide, and tris 8 hydroxy quinolo qu ah, that one, I'm, that one, wait, I need to see that one for one sec. Okay. You were so toxic. Oh, I was doing so good. And tris 8 hydroxy quinolinato aluminum. These are essentially electroluminescent dyes. Run a charge through them and they glow. Beyond these color generating compounds, which are called the hosts, an OLED is sandwiched between layers that help transport electrons and an anode and a cathode, the terminals which the electricity flows through. The anode is sometimes on the top surface and needs to be transparent so light from the OLED can pass through it. And indium tin oxide, or ITO, is the most common choice. Now, OLEDs are built on a substrate, typically glass, which has super thin layers of these chemicals we've just mentioned deposited onto it. This is done by heating the chemicals until they vaporize and then condensing them back onto the substrate. The display also incorporates a grid of thin film transistors, which make up the active matrix in Samsung's active matrix OLED. 
While normal transistors are built on a wafer of semiconducting material like silicon, thin film transistors are built, just like an OLED, on a substrate in layers. Each pixel ends up with a few individual transistors controlling it, and then the whole thing is encapsulated in another layer of glass or metal foil. And this part is super important because the compounds in an OLED break down in contact with the air and are quickly degraded by water. Get moisture inside an OLED and those carefully constructed layers might turn into soup. This whole manufacturing process, from vapor deposition to treating the silicon for the transistors, can involve temperatures as high as 1000 degrees C or 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. This wasn't a problem with smaller glass displays, but as people tried to make bigger and bigger TV screens, the high heat could warp or crack those huge panels of super thin glass, and lower temperature methods had to be found. The aptly named low temperature polysilicon was developed to help solve these problems, and bumps the temperatures required for manufacture down to around a mere 450 degrees C. As you might imagine, Lower temperatures are also a big advantage if you want to build an OLED on, say, plastic instead of glass, though 800 degrees Fahrenheit is still a lot for most plastics to handle. After the silicon circuits have been built, the hosts and electrodes can be applied, sometimes using manufacturing methods actually derived from inkjet printing. The various compounds are applied layer by layer from dozens of tiny nozzles. What would you folks actually want from a folding phone? Are you looking to replace your tablet and smartphone at once? Or do you just like the idea of a big screen? Personally, I want it to read comics on the train without lugging my iPad around. So how is Samsung's foldable display actually constructed? Well, we're not 100% sure, but here's what we know. The Fold's flexible screen is built on a plastic called polyamide. Kapton is a common polyamide used for everything from electrical insulation to the heat shield on the lunar lander. And if you've ever taken a laptop or phone apart, Kapton is present in the orangish plastic ribbons and circuits and cables that do things like connect your screen on a laptop to the mainboard. Like most polyamides, Kapton has a few special traits. Polyamides are remarkably heat resistant, and most can withstand temperatures over 400 degrees Fahrenheit, and a few are stable for brief periods up to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. And they're also, well, bendy. DuPont claims its polyamide films can stand up to over 200,000 folds. So polyamides can survive the high temperatures of OLED manufacturing, and they can stand up to mechanical stress. Sounds great, right? Well, the downside here is that like Kapton, most of them are bright orange, which isn't the best for building a screen. Samsung may have a traditional orange polyamide as the backplate to their new folding screens, but there are actually transparent polyamides called CPIs, which are pretty new technology, and we know Samsung has been buying a lot of them recently. A bigger question is what is Samsung using for the anode in the screen? This is the bit where the electrons leave the display. ITO, the indium tin oxide we'd mentioned, is used as an anode in almost every smartphone screen, but it's brittle. Now, Samsung may have found a way to make it stand up to folding, but generally ITO starts to crack after just a few flexes and its electrical properties go all to hell. There aren't too many other options for flexible, transparent, conductive materials, but we spotted two good candidates. In one, a super thin layer of silver is sandwiched between two layers of either zinc sulfide or oxide. These layers are less than 50 nanometers thick, and they are remarkably transparent and stand up to repeated bending with no loss of performance. The other candidate is called P.PSS, or bear with me again now, poly 3 4 ethylene dioxy thiophene polystyrene sulfonate. I can't find a reference to this compound actually being used in a consumer device, but researchers have been looking at it as a replacement for ITO for years, including a few studies that Samsung helped fund. P.PSS is a flexible, transparent, electrically conductive plastic, and that seems like it would be a great candidate for flexible OLEDs. One downside to P.PSS is that it loves water, and it absorbs it readily if the humidity cracks 50%. Any OLED using this compound would need to be thoroughly encapsulated, and you'd probably want to avoid journalists ripping any protective covers off your device too. This brings us to the last big innovation in these phones, and it's the one we know the least about. It is literally the glue that holds it all together. Unlike a lot of these other bits, which it's buying from outside suppliers, 
Samsung says it actually spent five years internally developing an adhesive that would keep all the layers of the screen sealed together. It's using a so-called optically clear adhesive, or OCA. This is essentially another thin film layer coated with an acrylic-based adhesive and used to stick all the layers in the screen together. Think like very fancy double-sided tape. OCA is actually super common in devices. Whenever we talk about displays that are bonded or laminated to glass to eliminate an air gap, that usually means the glass was glued to the display using some kind of OCA. Samsung's innovation seems to be developing an adhesive sticky enough to keep all those layers together and flexible enough that they claim it will keep them from splitting apart even after thousands and thousands of folds. It's hard to say yet how well all these parts work, and evidence does suggest Samsung still has a few issues to work out here, but a lot of engineering has already gone into getting flexible screens even to this point. So what's next? Well, in the future, graphene or carbon nanotube structures could lead to even thinner screens with better performance and a lot more durability. Flexible glass is also advancing at a remarkable rate, mostly by making the sheets incredibly thin. Corning and a German company, Schott, no relation, have both developed ultra-thin glass that can bend to around a 5 millimeter radius. And the Japanese glass company AGC claims to have a glass that can bend to two and a half millimeters. Now, these might not quite be bendy enough to fit on the Galaxy Fold's tiny internal bend, but it's plenty for the Mate X with its wider folding outer screen. There is a lot of complex engineering here, but like anything complicated, it might be better to wait until all the kinks get sorted out before you jump to buy anything. So what do you think? Are you folks still feeling enthusiastic for the Mate X, or have the reviews of the Galaxy Fold dampened your enthusiasm a bit? If companies could nail the reliability issues and get glass on the screen, would you want a folding phone then? Let us know what you think. And if you want to know if we actually like the Galaxy Fold, go check out our full review of that. We'll be back to talk about more components, and then at the end of May, we are heading off to Computex to see everything we can see about CPUs and computers and chips there. Subscribe to Engadget for all those updates and more.